Hello, hello, hello. I'm particularly delighted today to be joined by Diana uh, Butu. Uh, now, Diana Butu is a Palestinian who grew up in Canada, uh, lives in the West Bank, uh, previously took part in the peace negotiations between Palestine, the representatives of the Palestinian people, and Israel, a uh, former advisor to the Palestinian president and prime minister. Uh, but now, since then, a lawyer, uh, an analyst, a writer. You do have a lot of hats, Dana. We were talking about this beforehand. You were like, I don't have many hats. You have a lot of hats. That's many hats. Uh, but it's an honour to have you. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. It's really, the honour's all mine. Thank you. I just want to start with, uh, I mean, you know, there's so many horrors taking place right now. It's very difficult to know where to begin in some ways. Yeah. I think I, I keep circling back to this when I talk to people um, about this. Uh, which is the intent. Um, I chatted to Raz Sigal, who is an Israeli-American, for those who don't know, historian of genocide and Holocaust studies. And he said it's very rare that intent is so openly stated in these cases, often when regime states engage in gross human rights abuses, war crimes, they try and cover it up. They're quite subtle about it. Not so in this case. And the latest example is Benjamin Netanyahu essentially confessing that the plan is to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian people from Gaza. Um, he was asked about in terms of what's called voluntary migration, um, and that being, um, he's saying that's what we're working towards. No one thinks voluntary migration is a thing. Um, uh, it, it would mean the forcible displacement of the Palestinian people. I just want your thoughts, your response to that. Given you're someone who had to negotiate previously with the Israeli state in terms of the context, because obviously there's the Nakba 1948 when you got the mass expulsion of 700,000 Palestinians, so more than. What's your thought? What's your response to what Benjamin Netanyahu said there? You know, this is precisely what uh, what uh, Professor Raz Segal was talking about, which is that that it's rare that you see these leaders come out and very openly describe intent. When we when we look at genocide, there's two components to it. One is the actual carrying out of genocide, ethnic cleansing, et cetera, crimes against humanity. And the second part is the intent. And, and it's that intent part that is often the most difficult to prove. But here we are from day one, this Israeli prime minister made clear that what he wants to see is the elimination of Gaza. We heard this through members of the Israeli cabinet, we, we heard this through members, uh, through the Israeli president himself, who uh, all came forward and, and made these claims uh, that Gaza needs to be made smaller, that there are no innocents in Gaza. And, and what Netanyahu has been saying all throughout this period is that he wants to push Palestinians out of the Gaza Strip into the Sinai Peninsula and then other places as well in order to make a, as they put it, smaller and smaller in size Gaza Strip. So the intent is very clear there. And one of the things that's very interesting is that not only has he made this intent clear, he's made the actions clear. The actions have exactly followed and replicated his intent. And yet we see people try to stretch their imagination and try to do these mental uh, gymnastics to somehow think that that's not exactly what Netanyahu wants, when he's made it very clear this is what he wants. It's, again, it's not just him, it's members of his cabinet, it's members of the Israeli army, it's uh, the Israeli president. Across the Israeli spectrum, this is what you see. And instead of the world putting the brakes on Netanyahu, they somehow seem to be falling into this plan. What he has done is he has made the Gaza Strip unlivable. If you look at Gaza City, Gaza City used to be the largest Palestinian city in the occupied Palestinian territories, and it now no longer exists. He wiped Gaza City off the map, making the Gaza Strip unlivable. And the next step is to do everything from say, you want education? Sure, go to the Sinai. You want healthcare? Sure, go to Egypt. Do you, do you want to uh, have a house? Sure, go to Egypt. and the, Or from there, go to Canada or go to Austria or go to Australia or where, wherever it is. This is the problem is that nobody has been listening to what he is saying and nobody is actually stopping him as he's clear that he's carrying out genocide. I mean, another example is, I mean, there's so many, but in terms of that point you make about making Gaza inhospitable, the, the conditions being for life being made impossible, which is one of the basic 
course, tenets of, of making a genocide possible, um, is flooding. Um, the They say they're going to flood Hamas tunnels with seawater, um, and that would then flood the water supplies of Gaza and then obviously make it impossible for people to drink fresh water. I mean, I, I mean, just that, that point, I interviewed as well Omar Bartov, who's another um, Israeli-born historian, scholar of genocide studies, and he, he was talking about ethnic cleansing and genocide and when one becomes the next. And he says, the thing is, genocide can so easily become, uh, sorry, ethnic cleansing can become genocide because people don't want to move. And then, then you have to kill them. And I just think in Gaza, it seems very striking to me. People, the Palestinian people obviously do not want to move. They know the history of the Palestinian people, which is once you leave, you don't come back. Correct. So I'm just interested in that kind of how, if, you know, when they talk about voluntary migration, what will it take, do you think, in terms of, you know, in, in practical terms, would, would 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 Palestinian people, even if things become so difficult, would that happen? Would they leave under duress? Yes, and that's what he's doing. This is precisely what he's aiming to do. Look, the, the attack that Israel has been carrying out on Palestinian hospitals, on schools, on churches, on mosques, they, these, this is deliberate. It's deliberately designed to ruin the infrastructure that existed within the Gaza Strip. Add to that the flooding, as you've already mentioned, of the water supply. Now, as I'm sure you already know this, Owen, 95% of the water supply that was in the Gaza Strip was actually undrinkable. And it was undrinkable because Israel was never allowing Palestinians to repair the water aquifer that rests underneath the Gaza Strip. And so it was already unlivable. But now with the bombing of all of this infrastructure, with all of this, these people who are wounded, the thousands of people wounded, the thousands of people who under the age of 18 who required amputations, this in order to treat them requires infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if if and he knows that it, in order for people to get this treatment, they're not going to be able to do so in the Gaza Strip. So just to be able to stay alive, they're going to go out and they're going to leave to Egypt and then further further onwards, whether it is to Jordan or, or other parts of the Arab world or to, or to North America or to Europe. This is precisely what he is working towards. And he said as much. This is precisely what they're looking to work, working towards doing. And this is why it amounts to genocide. It's not just wiping people and killing them and wiping them off the map, but making it so that they cannot survive, that they cannot have a sustainable life, uh, cutting off all measures of having a life. And that's what he did with day one, when he announced that there was going to be no electricity, no water supply, no fuel, no food supplies in, and no, no medicines either. The amount of humanitarian aid that is coming into the Gaza Strip now is barely a trickle to meet the needs of one day of the of the the, the population of the Gaza Strip, much less after 81 days of a sustained bombing campaign. I'm interested in your thoughts about the role of the US in all of this. Um, we get what I would describe as hand-wringing. I think that's the right term for what Joe Biden keeps doing, occasionally talking about the sheer number who've been killed innocent civilians in, in Gaza. Um, Jeremy Scarhill, the brilliant investigative journalist who watched The Intercept, who I interviewed, said that Joe Biden could end all of this with a phone call. I'm just wondering what your thoughts about this, about the kind of moral posturing you sometimes get from Joe Biden and then what in practice the US role actually is. Look, this isn't just, this isn't a war Israel versus over Gaza. This isn't an Israeli attack on Gaza. This is an Israeli American attack on Gaza. And why do I say that? You know, the, the Israelis um, could have stopped this a long time ago, and the Americans could have stopped this a long time ago, but neither one is stopping this. Neither one is choosing to do it. In fact, in the first days of the attack on the Gaza Strip, we saw everything from more aid come into Israel from the United States. We saw that um, aircraft carriers came into, into Israel. We saw that more weapons came in and army personnel as well. And, and so this isn't just a simple, 
support for Israel as it continues its very brutal attack on the Gaza Strip. This is very much funded and facilitated by the United States. And the fact that we've seen Biden repeat these false claims day after day after day, the fact that we've seen that they have not actually supported a, a, any UN Security Council resolution calling for a complete stop to Israel's bombing campaign. Uh, the best that they could do was call for humanitarian pauses, and only then they abstained. It's very clear that this is not just an Israeli war on on, on the Gaza Strip, but it's an Israeli and American war on the Gaza Strip. Now, when it comes to the one phone call, one of the things that's very interesting is that the Israelis uh, in their own media are talking about how it is that they're the ones who are calling the shots, that it's no longer up to the United States to tell Israel when it is that it can and should stop things. And yet at the same time, this is the same country that is accepting this military aid, that is accepting these weaponry, that's accepting the the aircraft carriers, and that is accepting the military personnel. Uh, and so as much as Israel wants to prop itself up and show that this is a question of their own free will, we know very well that this is very much funded and fueled by the United States. This is Biden's war. I mean, in terms of what happens next in terms of the role of the US, you know, the polling is very clear that many natural, you know, large chunks of the democratic coalition, I'm thinking of younger people, I'm thinking of Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, are obviously very angry about this, to say the least. Um, younger Americans, according to the poll, are the most pro-Palestinian generation in American history. And what often happens is the democratic establishment will scream at these people, you, this, you have to vote against Trump, you have a duty and a responsibility. You know, rather than try to listen to their concerns, they'll just scream at them. Like, you're a disgrace, you're a moral outrage, how dare you? We hate you, but vote for us. Um, and that doesn't generally often work with people. And a lot of, lot of them might not vote and sit on their hands. And the consequence of that could be Trump. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts of what that could mean in practice, that Biden's strategy um, just to allow this mass slaughter um, could lead to his own voters refusing to vote for him and then Trump. And what would that mean in terms of Trump in all of this? It's not clear. It's not entirely clear because the Democratic Party has always been very good at dangling Trump out as saying, you must vote for him. If not, if you if you don't vote for Biden, then you're going to get Trump. It's not entirely clear to me what will happen. That said, I, I do think that there is a lot of movement in the United States and a lot of people who are cutting through the propaganda machine that they've seen come to play over the course of the past 81 days. And what's fascinating is that you see that people are actually searching for the truth. And as much as Israel, aided by the way, by many mainstream outlets, as much as they're trying to hide the truth, as much as they're trying to portray this as, as a war of equal sides, people are looking for what's actually happening in Gaza. And when they find out, when they see that over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed by, by Israeli bombs, when they see that these bombs are also killing kids, when they see that the basics of food and medical supplies and water are not being allowed in, and when they see that hospitals are being deliberately targeted, it's not at all, um, it, it doesn't, it's not a stretch of the imagination for them to be calling out their representatives and saying, we want this to stop. The real question becomes what's going to happen in the future and whether these people are actually listening to how it is that younger people, and not just younger people, but people all across the spectrum, how it is that they're actually feeling, or if they're going to continue to hide behind the boogeyman, i.e. Trump. One of the things I'm interested in, just in terms of broader context, given your role that you used to be on, you know, negotiating with Israel. I'm interested because I know you ended up regretting that. And I think yeah. that itself is quite interesting in itself. So it'd be good to talk about that. Um, it's just recently there was um, an intervention uh, by uh, Zippy Hotevelli, who, and I use this in the worst possible way, an extraordinary individual, um, is the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Um, and when she was asked about the possibility of a two-state solution, she said, absolutely not. Um, and then Mark Regev, who I would say is a very slick performer, if you want an apologist for mass slaughter, then he, he's he's a slick performer. Uh, but he was asked about this and he said, and I thought this was actually one of the most important interviews of the whole horror show. 
um, which he said, well, actually, if you look back at, you know, Yitzhak, Yitzhak Rabin, the former uh, Israeli prime minister, who was seen as a peacemaker, but he said the Palestinians would get an entity less than a state. And the reason I bring that up is what's often, you know, the narrative is, well, the Palestinians have these opportunities to have a state. They have these opportunities and they turn them down and therefore they are the architects of their own catastrophe. And I'm just wondering, just given that he basically blew that narrative up, I thought un unintentionally, what your thoughts are as a former member of the negotiating team and why, you know, why you regretted it, I suppose, in that context. Look, the, the architects of the catastrophe are Israel. That's what we call the Nakba. The Nakba literally means catastrophe in Arabic. And the architects of it were are Israel and Israelis who believe in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, who continue to main, maintain a state on the ruins of Palestinian villages, including my family's own, own village, uh, who to this very day continue to maintain a system of apartheid, who continue to push and advocate and carry out plans of ethnic cleansing, albeit in a slower fashion before, uh, before this latest attack began on, on the Gaza Strip. So if anybody's the architect, it's them. But to get to the point about, about what Itzhak Rabin said, Mark Rekhova is right. And, and this is why I think it's so important for uh, people to understand that there has never in the Israeli mindset been an idea that Palestinians are entitled to equality or to, to be entitled to an equal state. They've never had this in their in their mindset. For them, the, the mindset is all about ethnic, ethnic cleansing, which is something that both Zippy and Mark Regev um, believe in. Or they have in their mind the idea that Palestinians are less than and therefore deserving less than a state. Um, and so what when what what Itzhak Rabin in his very last speech before the Knesset, before he was assassinated, what he said was that there were going to be settlements that would remain, that Palestinians would be maintaining their own affairs, but that it would be less than a state. And that has been the maximum of what Israel has ever thought through. And when I when I was part of the negotiations and the thing that that um, the reason that I regretted it is is that there, it very much provided this facade that there were two equal parties that were somehow negotiating together. And if only they could just come to an agreement, then there would be peace and there would be a state and there would be all these wonderful things. But what it what it really did was it masked this colonization plan. It masked Israel's establishment of settlements. It masked the, the taking of Palestinian land. It masked the killing of Palestinians. It masked the caging in of Palestinians. It masked their imprisonment. It masked everything. And, and for what? All that Israel has ever said that it, the maximum that it would be willing to do is to expand the cages that we already live in. They never had in mind to let us free. It was just to simply ex expand the prisons that that they've put us in for all of these years. Um, and that's why I, I speak about regretting it, because I regret being part of a process that served as a facade. Again, you know, it wasn't I wasn't the person who, who created the facade. But the mere fact that we had these negotiations really led people down this path to think that everything was going to be magically undone. The occupation would be magically undone if we just reached an agreement where we dotted the I's and crossed the T's. And that, of course, was not anything that was ever on the table. And that's eventually why I quit. One of the things I want to talk to you about is the West Bank. And you're in the West Bank uh, right now. Um, the West Bank, the horror there has been overshadowed by just the, the moral depravity of the assault on Gaza. I mean, you know, before 7th of October this year, around 240 Palestinians had been killed in the West Bank, including dozens of children. And, you know, it's just horrible. Um, but I think that's also interesting in the context of when uh, this idea there was a ceasefire that existed before the 7th of October. Because if 240 Israelis had been killed, including dozens of Israeli children before the 7th of October, nobody would be talking about that in the context of a ceasefire by Palestinian forces, for example. So I'm just interested in terms of what, what's been happening even before this in the West Bank, how this has escalated and what you think the overall kind of Israeli strategy is in the West Bank. It's, uh, it's what I would call death by a thousand cuts. And what do I mean by that? What the Israelis have done is that each and every day up until October the 7th, 
they had been systematically killing Palestinians. In fact, 2023, before October the 7th, was actually the deadliest year for Palestinians in the West Bank. And that was because almost every day there was an Israeli raid on a Palestinian town. Almost every day a Palestinian was Israel killed a Palestinian. Almost every day there were attacks by Israeli settlers against Palestinians. And each and every day the Israelis were turning a blind eye. The international community was turning a blind eye to this. I mean, they were, it, it was just as though we were invisible and, and didn't exist. And this is just is the price of living under military occupation. What I don't think that people understand is that occupation is violent. Mm. It's very violent. To live under occupation is to live under a system of violence. For Israel to take land, it requires violence. To build a settlement requires violence. To put up a checkpoint requires violence. To maintain the checkpoint requires violence. When you look at the numbers of Palestinians that Israel has imprisoned, you're looking at roughly 20% of the Palestinian population has been thrown in jail at one point in time or, or another. And, and so each and every day um, living in the West Bank is to live with Israeli violence. In addition to living with the system of apartheid, in addition to living in the midst of, of settlers and so on, it's a very violent existence that Israel's meeting out against Palestinians each and every day. But the way that it's done is that it's done slowly and methodically. And because this violence is ever present, it's slow and it's methodical, it doesn't reach those headlines. It doesn't, it doesn't make the news, but it matters to us because our loved ones matter to us. It matters to us because our future matters to us. Yes. And, and it's that level of the meeting out of violence daily by Israel. And the fact that the world has ignored all of this, it leads to such, des such desperation and despair. To, you know, even looking today, since October the 7th, more than 240 Palestinians have been killed by, by Israel. Um, and then, again, it's daily violence with, with daily people, Israel arresting people, throwing them in, in prison without charge, without trial, including Khaled al-Jarrar, who was, again, just picked up. Um, again, not, no, no clear reason why. That's what it means to live under Israeli military rule. And it's, it's become so commonplace and so methodical and, and so every day that Israelis have ignored it, the world has ignored it, and we're just so, somehow expected to live with it. Hmm. it. This, Owen, is the height of dehumanization. When it gets to the point where Palestinians are somehow just expected to live with it um, and 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 behave as though life is normal when it's not normal. As you said, if it had been Israelis, the world would be going crazy because they don't dehumanize Israelis, but they do dehumanize Palestinians. That point you made about incarceration, again, something which I think, you know, we've heard obviously so much about the hostages and obviously taking hostages is a, is a war crime. The, the incarceration of Palestinians, um, which often the world don't, Many people aren't aware of the conditions. So you get this military court system, Chilt, the only so-called democracy. Obviously, Israel isn't a democracy by virtue of the occupation of the West Bank. It can't be. But, you know, children being tried in a military court and save the children, the charity. Um, their investigation found that children had been are, are sexually abused, physically abused. I mean, that just that point, isn't it? That incarceration, the number who've been incarcerated, just the impact, the, the violence that that isn't reflected in Western media coverage. Not at all. Not at all. It, during the, the first um, prisoner exchange, I interviewed many of these children, because they were children, who had been released by the Israelis in exchange. And the, the, the stories that they told me were harrowing. They, it sh these stories should keep people up at night. And I'm just going to give you a little flavor. Each and every one of them talked about being abused on a daily basis of being tortured on a, on a daily basis. The Israelis often put um, uh, so upwards of 10 boys in one cell together and gave them enough food for, um, for two to maximum three, only twice a day. 
So they were effectively starved. They let them use um, the, the, they let them have a shower once every third day for a maximum of 10 minutes a day. They weren't allowed to see family. They weren't allowed access to their lawyers. Um, they weren't allowed access to any electricity. They, if they asked questions about their incarceration, they were beaten. Um, and as they were finally being released, each and every one of them told me about massive beatings and showed me the beatings that, that, that they received. Uh, some of them, in fact, all of them, were denied medical uh, attention, including a boy where the Israelis broke his arm in several places, denied him any medical treatment. Others talked about, about um, being raped. And these are things that were happening to children, the vast majority of whom were being held without charge and without trial. If, if, if that doesn't trouble people, then I don't know what will. Um, it's certainly something that, that the world has the power to end this, mm. and they choose not to. They choose not to. Well, that's my final point, really, that, that I was going to ask you. You know, there's, I sometimes think about this. When I, when I first moved to London many years ago, uh, this is back in 2005, and, you know, I'm from the north, found people in London not particularly friendly compared to northerners. And this woman started a, your woman started up a conversation with me. She was, uh, you know, a young South African, as it turned out. And I mentioned that my, my dad had known Tarba Mbeki in exile back in the 60s. They shared a coat bottle once with each other. That's my claim to fame. Um, and she suddenly said, yes, apartheid wasn't working anymore, which kind of chilled me at the time. The point I'm making is yeah. most white South Africans did buy into apartheid, actually, for a very long time and passionately so. That's just a fact. And they ended up abandoning it for the reasons that young South African said, which was international pressure made it unviable. They were forced against their will to abandon that system. And the difference is, in terms of the Israeli population, most of whom, they're very brave Israeli peace activists, I'm always in awe of who I keep interviewing, they're so marginalised because there's an overwhelming, at the moment most, according to public, the polls, most Israelis think not enough firepower has been used in Gaza. What on earth does that look, even look like in practice? Um, so I'm just wondering how this ends, because as things stand, the US, as you say, it's essentially a US-Israeli attack, the, the last remaining superpower has given a blank check to Israel to behave as it wishes. Israeli public opinion knows that, and therefore there isn't any incentive to do anything to change. So how does this possibly end? I think you're, you're going to be surprised by my answer. Um, and maybe I, I'm actually also surprising myself. Um, I don't think this is going to end well for Israel. And the reason that I say this is, you know, even in that conversation that you had with this form, or maybe former or current South African, the response was South Africa was apartheid wasn't working. And today, if you look at South Africa, I think you'd be really hard pressed to find people in South Africa who will very proudly proclaim that they were pro apartheid. There are some, but I think the vast majority are people who say, oh, I was, I was opposed from the beginning. You know, everybody becomes uh, um, in mm -hmm. the know and, and on the right side of history after it's been proven that you're on the wrong side of history. And I, in a way, I think that this is also going to happen here as well. And the reason that I say this is for as much as we see and we hear this talk of ethnic cleansing, and every day if you turn on the Israeli news uh, and watch it, you'll, you'll see people who are sort of rallying Israelis to say, hit them harder, hit them faster, hit them more, hit, hit, hit. And as you said, it's, it's something like 60% um, of Israelis who say that they're not hitting Gaza enough. Only 2% in the last poll said that it was too much. So you're really talking about 98% who either believe that it's enough or not enough um, in terms of what it is that Israel's doing. But despite that, there is inside Israel a recognition that they can't win. Why is it that they're recognizing that they can't well win? First, if you look at the number of Israeli soldiers who are coming back in body bags, 
the number is high for Israelis. Again, it's not it's not 20,000. We're talking 180, something like that. Uh, but that's high for Israelis, especially when you compare it to the 18 years of them occupying southern Lebanon from 82 to, to 2000. It's more than double that. But more importantly than that, I don't think that they... I don't think that they see that this government has another end game. And I think that increasingly, as we see that this government doesn't have an end goal, you know, it's, it's, it's in Netanyahu's interest to prolong this war because he knows that the minute that the war is over, he is finished as prime minister. He already has corruption scandals against him. Israelis, even those who supported him are now very angry with him over October 7th and post-October 7th in terms of handling of the families in the South uh, and, and so on. Um, and so for, the, for many Israelis, I don't think that they see that there is a clean way for them to come out of this. But more importantly than that is that Palestinians have shown the world strength, conviction, resilience, pride, humanity, love, all things that Israel has not shown the world hmm. at all. And so, you know, I, in part, I say this because in order to survive living in this country, you have to remain optimistic. That's the only way you can survive living here in a, in a country that seeks to ethnically cleanse you and talks about it every day. But on another level, this isn't just the question of being optimistic and hopeful. I truly believe deep down inside me that this isn't going to end well for Israel. And that in this not ending well for Israel, we're going to get to a place in space in 20 years time where people say, I was always against the occupation mm -hmm. when we know that they were never against the occupation. I think that's a brilliant place to end and maybe provides more hope than I was expecting from that answer. I have to say when I asked that question. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think that's a very profound uh, thing to say. And I think a lot of people, I think, I think are maybe arriving at similar conclusions. Uh, Danny, that was a real pleasure. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Inshallah. You know, it's, um, uh, so, you know, I live, I live between Haifa and Ramallah. Haifa mm -hmm. is um, a city in the north. And you see these cars all over the place mm -hmm. um, and signs all over the place. Like you can't maybe walk 50 meters without seeing a sign that says, together we will succeed. Or you can't, for, when you're on the road, for every car, there's probably three cars that say, uh, that have a bumper sticker that says finish them mm -hmm. and and so i've asked people well what does finish them mean what does together we will succeed mean and can you believe that they don't have an they don't have an answer like the most prevalent sign that you see here is together we will succeed and when i ask people because i do what is what does success look like they actually don't have a, a coherent answer mm -hmm. The only answer that they can come up with um, is the one that frightens me the most, which is we're going to get rid of them. And when I when I say, well, what is them? You know, what finish them? What is the them? Some people will say Hamas, but I've also come to realize that Hamas is code for Gaza, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Hamas or them is code for all Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so when you live in a place, like I live in a place, this place is completely and totally genocidal. Hmm. And, uh, and it's scary. It's scary. Yeah. I, th I think that's something as well that the world needs to hear. So genocidal mentality that's been allowed to take hold yeah. unchallenged with the direct complicity of Western governments. And I might add as well, the Western much of the Western media as well. And that dehumanization of the Palestinian people runs not just for Israeli society, but so much of the Western media and, and the Western elites.